Bonjour. I know that you have missed my smiling face for the last week. So this is on chapter 18, um, talking about the urinary system disorders. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so with the urinary system, it's very important, guys. Okay, so it does a lot of things um, that, you know, you don't even really stop to think about, but it really is just a super important thing. And what's awesome is when we talk about, like, you know, the kidneys and, like, the loops and um, the ascending and descending loops of the um in the nephrons, etc. You know, pharmacologically, we target these different parts of the kidney system, to, or the renal system, to um, be able to figure out what meds are going to work to, you know, be diuretics or antidiuretics, or you know, to work in osmotically this way or that way. So it's so incredibly cool. Okay, so the urinary system removes metabolic waste. It's also going to be removing hormones from the body when needed. Um, it removes drugs and other foreign materials from the body. Um, it regulates waters, electrolytes, acid balances, which, as we know from just basic physiology, these are very important. You kick these off balance, and it can lead to um, muscle cramps, contraction uh, problems, you know, death. It can lead to a whole bunch of things. Um, it secretes erythropoietin. It activates vitamin D, and it also regulates blood pressure through the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. So there's a lot of things that it, it does. Okay, so um, this, again, is chapter 18, which starts on page 488 in your book. So the urinary system, when we're talking about the anatomy, apparently I have a case of the yawns. Um, we go, the largest is the kidney, and then we have the ureters. And then it, the urine is going to pool and gather in the urinary bladder, and then it exits the body through the urethra. So that's like the hierarchy of um, in the anatomy, anatomical hierarchy, or fancy words, of um, what's going on. Um, okay, the gross anatomy of the urinary system is, again, shown here in a larger picture. And this is figure 18.1 in your book on page 490. And this is just saying the location of the urinary system. Up here in A, this is the anterior view of the urinary organs with the peritoneum and the visceral organs removed. So it has just a clear shot of the urinary system. Uh, down here in B, this would be the surface, surface markings of the kidneys, um, the 11th and the 12th ribs. So you can see the ribs are up here, just so for anatomical uh, location. Um, the spinous processes of L1 through L4 and the lower, lower edge of the pleura uh, from the posterior view. Okay. Um, down to C, down here, this is going to be the horizontal, otherwise known as the transverse section of the abdomen that shows the retroperitoneal position of the kidneys so that they're kind of in the back. So that's why like MMA fighters or whatever, or anyone that gets into a street fight, because you know me, I watch documentaries about things that are so far from my life. Um, you know, kidney kicks are very, very uh horrible, right? They're painful and they can cause a lot of damage if you get kicked with like lower back quadrant because as you can see, your kidneys are back back there. And so if you're having like lower back right pain, lower right, yeah back pain in the, either the lower right area or the lower left area, you know, and you're having other issues, of course, too, just not back pain, then they might think of like kidney problems. The specific anatomy of the kidney can be seen here. Um, it's shaped like a kidney bean, guys, right? And so I <laughs> probably the kidney came before the kidney bean, but, um, you know, it's just anatomical naming, I don't know, whatever. But it's just, it's very, very cool. Um, this is on page 491 in your book. And so, as you can see, you have your your reader coming in here. And the helium is this, like, the section where it comes into the actual kidney and it starts to branch off. Then you have, um, you know, it's very vascularized. So you have your interlobular uh, arteries. So break that down to those root words. Inter is in between. And lobular are those little lobes that you're seeing here, like the little sections, right? 
Um, you have a renal column, you have the renal sinus that's there, you have the fibrous capsule as kind of like a protection um, in it, you have the cortex, you have the minor calyces, and the major calyces, okay? You have fat deposits as well. Uh, you have what's called the renal pelvis, which is this uh, common area here. You have the medullary pyramid that you can see there. And then you have the renal papilla of the pyramid. And then again, um, the medulla, okay? And so um, the, you don't get really familiar with the anatomy, but just also be no, like, it's so cool. I almost just swore, sorry. It's so very, very cool. We'll just change that word to the V word. Very, very, very cool, okay? So hopefully I gave you guys a little bit of laughs. I'm like, Again, I hope you haven't turned this into a drinking game yet with how many times she says, um, how cool and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> oh, anyway. Okay. So the kidney. Uh, the nephrons are very important. These are the functional, functional units of kidneys, and each kidney has over a million nephrons. Okay. So it's highly, highly sophisticated. Um, each uh, the kidney has a renal corpuscle, and this includes the glomerulus as well as Bowman's capsule, which is so cool. And then also, can you tell I love the kidney? I, I say this with every single organ system, I swear. I think my favorite is brain, and then heart, and then kidneys. Yeah. Okay, anyway, we have our renal tubules, which you have your proximal convoluted tubules, that loop of Henle that I was talking about before, that's going to, we can really target where our pharmacologic um, meds want to go to, and also those distal convoluted tubules, as well as a collecting duct. So <clears throat> this is a picture of a complete nephron, all right, um, this is on page 492 of your book. So, um... This uh, here is C, and the, uh, showing the complete nephron. And um, so basically, like I said, it's very, um, it's very detailed, right? So you have your blood supply. So you have your afferent arterial, which is leading into the area. Then you have your glomerulus capsule or capillaries, okay, where you're going to have some more exchange. Then you have your efferent arterial. So afferent is coming to, efferent is going away from. And then you can see that these are very intercalated with the um, collection, the distal convoluted tubule, right? And then you have your proximal convoluted tubule. So first you have the proximal convoluted tubule, and then it goes down here into the loop of Henry, right? And then you have the paratubule capillaries. So, and then it comes out through the distal convoluted tubule, the collecting duct, um, and then again, vascularization, the urine full. What this is showing you guys, okay, so the blood curses through your whole body, right? So while it's going, you know, it's getting pumped from your heart into everywhere, then it comes back and it needs to be like filtered before we can kind of, uh, you know, recirculate it so that we can get out all of those toxins. So all of this vascularization here, this is where it's going to be dropping off water, dropping off sodium, dropping off, you know, this, picking up potassium, all through these really, um, you know, vascularized loops, right? And so this, again, is pharmacologically very, very important because we can target these different parts because we know exactly which part is absorbing what. And so it's amazing, okay? And so we're going to be seeing, um, you know, in one of the slides coming up here that, you know, the water is going to be, um, you know, take in, taken back into the body in this area where on the ascending it's going to be sodium and chloride are coming back in, right, in the reabsorption. So it just continues to go, and it's just so incredibly cool. All right, so how is urine um, formed, okay? Well, it is uh, through filtration, okay? So like I said, we have all these things that are going on in our um, body, right? And we have to, um, you know, get rid of the, um, the toxins, the metabolites, right? Things that we don't need just floating around in the body. So the filtration is going to occur in those renal corpuscles. And these are, is where a large volume of the fluid is going to pass from the glomerular, glomerular capillaries. Wow, I don't usually have a problem saying that one. Glomerular capillaries into the tubule. And this is the area of the Bowman's capsule. 
And so this is when waste, nutrients, electrolytes, and other dissolved substances are going to be, um, you know, uh, dealt with, right? And then the cells and the protein are going to be remaining in the blood. We also have reabsorption that occurs. And reabsorption um, is for those essential nutrients as well as water and electrolytes into those paratubular capillaries. And this is what's going to control the pH and electrolytes. So reabsorption. Let me say that this is what it's doing. Okay, so the transport mechanisms for reabsorption include both active transport, where we're using um, energy to actively move something, co transport, where basically something's going to like hop on something else that's already going through, so it's like doing it together, and then osmosis, which is how we move water. We also have in the proximal proximal convoluted tubules. This is where most of the water reabsorption is happening. This is also where our sugar reabsorption is happening. And our nutrients and electrolytes are also going to be um, stabilized here in order to maintain, again, that homeostatic level that we've talked about since the very, very beginning. We need to keep things at the homeostatic level because we get things off track and it can cause us a ton of problems. You get sodium concentrations off um, kilter and the sodium potassium ATPase pump, which is for major muscle contractions and stuff, can get off kilter. And guess what? One of your major muscles are, guys, your ticker, right? So this is why we really need to understand what's going on in the kidney so that we can understand where to target things when things go wrong. This is pathophysiology, okay? Um, so this is a picture of the formation of urine. And this is figure 18.4 in your book on page 493. And so um, basically, yeah, what you're going to be doing here is in the afferent arterial, you know, this is showing the flow of the blood. Um, this is going to be going in and step one here is the filtration of the water, right? And then over here in step two is the reabsorption. And so you can see that glucose and amino acids and sodium and water are all going to be coming back in, right, um, from the urethra if we need to, um, the kidney parts. And then um, in the paratubial arteries, we have the filtrate that is going to be coming um, in if it needs to. Water is coming back in through osmosis. Sodium and chloride is going to be um, expelled from are um, the, the, uh, the uh, ascending, right, and back into the blood if we need to be, and then it can go back into uh, the blood. So you can see that there's multiple different checkpoints, right? So sodium and chlorine can go out here, sodium and chlorine can come out here, um, but potassium, hydrogen, and other drugs can come in here in the distal convoluted tubule, and then again, the water can come you know, in and out through multiple different parts. But this is the ADH effect, so the antidiuretic hormone effect, right? So this is basically where, um, you know, water would go out of the urinary system and back into the water to keep you from being over dehydrated, right? And then again, oops, whatever goes and ends up going through and ends up, um, you know, needing to leave the body then that's going to be coming into this collecting duct and then leaving uh, the renal system and going into the um, bladder, the urinary bladder where it will be conducting. So um, a couple different hormones that are involved in reabsorption would be ADH, which is the antidiuretic hormone, and this is secreted by the posterior pituitary gland. Um, this is in charge of the reabsorption of water in the distal convoluted tubules as well as in the collecting ducts. We have aldosterone, and this is secreted by the adrenal cortex, and this is responsible for sodium reabsorption in exchange for potassium or hydrogen. We also have antinatriuretic hormone, and this is a hormone um, from the heart, and this is going to reduce sodium and fluid resorption. So when we're talking about blood flow through the kidney, there's a specialized um, pattern. And so basically, um, you're going to go from the renal artery to the interlobular artery to the arcuate artery to the interlobular artery to the afferent arterial 
to the glomerular capillaries, to the efferent arterial, the paratubular capillaries, the interlobular vein, arcuate vein, the interlobular vein, and then the renal vein. Okay, so this would be a good um, little flow chart thing to um, kind of draw and know and understand. All right, talking about GFR, this is the glomerular filtration rate. And so afferent and efferent arterioles of the glomerulus are very important and um, are um, used in calculation, calculating this rate. So autoregulation and hormone control um, pressure in the glomerular capillaries are controlled by either vasoconstriction of the afferent arteriole. So vaso is, you know, the blood constriction is making it smaller. And so if we have vasoconstriction, then this would um, decrease the glomerular pressure and therefore um, decrease the filtrate. Where we have a dilation of the ar afferent arteriole, this would cause an increased pressure in the glomerulus, and therefore increasing the filtrate. And then we can use, also use vasoconstriction of the efferent arteriole. So again, this one was afferent and this one is efferent. And so the vasoconstriction of the efferent arteriole is gonna cause the increased pressure in the glomerulus, and this therefore would cause increased filtrate. So this is diagram um, 18.5 in your book on page uh, 294. And so, again, this is going to be the control of the glomerular filtration rate. My, my face over. Uh, do, 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 do. Hold on, I know I'm messing around with stuff. There, okay. So here you have normal filtration, and this is where you have your apparent arterial coming and then um, exiting through the efferent arterial. And then in this little ball looking thing is the glomerular capillaries. In the cup looking thing, this is the Bowman's capsule. And so the filtrate is gonna be proximal to the convoluted tubule. And again, this is a normal filtration. In afferent arterial dilation, what happens is we have vasodilation, which causes increased blood flow. And so because of that, it's going to cause this increased glomerular hydrostatic pressure, and therefore it's going to cause more, right? And it's going to cause increased filtrate. Down here in C, we have um, what happens is the vasoconstriction. So you can see that it's constricting here. Vasoconstriction is going to lead to decreased blood flow. And then this, therefore, would lead to increased glomerular hydrostatic pressure and also increased filtrate. Finally, over here in the afferent arterial constriction, we have vasoconstriction, which is gonna to lead to decreased blood flow. And um, this is going to lead to low glomerular hydrostatic pressure and therefore leading to decreased filtrate. Okay, so again, that's figure 18.5 in the old book. All right, so, um, why do we care, right? So control of the arterial construction, again, can occur by three different ways. Autoregulation, kind of that homeostasis, right? So this is going to be local adjustments that are going to occur in the diameter of the arterioles. And this is going to be made in response to changes in the blood flow in the kidneys. We also have the sympathetic nervous system. And this is where we have increases in vasoconstriction in both arteries. Also, run in, and this is where we have it secreted by the juxtaglomerular cells when the blood flow to the afferent arterial is reduced. And this is what's really um, being played on with the renin angiotensin mechanism. So, table 18.1 in your book, um, this is going to be the compensation of uh, blood and filtrate as well as urine. And um, this is on page 489 in your book. And so we mostly have water, okay? And so um, we have blood, we have filtrate, and then we have urine. So we have water, um, cells are present in blood, they're not present in filtrate, and they're not present in urine normally, right? Now, if there's an infection or something going wrong, these can all go off. This is normal homeostatic levels. Uh, glucose usually is about a thousand, filtrate thousand, urine, no sugar usually. Uh, protein, right? So you can look at all of these different uh, levels, okay? So what about incontinence and retention? Well, 
incontinence is um, a loss of voluntary control of the bladder. And um, so basically, like, you know, young kids, they have to learn how to voluntarily control the nervous system um, as the nervous system matures. And so this is potty training, right? Um, and enuresis defines the involuntary urination of a child after age four to five when bladder control can be expected. Um, and most children have nocturnal uresis only. Okay. So often if they, if they do this longer than four years old, it's related to a developmental delay, sleep patterns, or psychosocial aspects. And this is, uh, started to be discussed on page 493. We also have stress incontinence. And this is more common in women. And so this is where we have an increased intra-abdominal pressure that forces the urine through the sphincter. And the sphincter is just like the muscular contraction that keeps um, something where it's supposed to be, right? And so um, this stress incontinence can come from coughing, lifting, or laughing. And it's more common after multiple pregnancies. So, you know, there's, it's not a joke because it's real, but, you know, women after they have a baby, they'll, they'll laugh too hard and they'll tinkle in their, their pants, right? Or they'll sneeze or they'll, um, you know, just pick up something a little bit too heavy or whatever. This is called stress incontinence. Um, you have overflow incontinence, and this is where you have incomplete bladder sphincters. And basically in older adults, um, the weakened dutrusor muscles may prevent a complete emptying of the bladder. And so um, this can lead to frequency as, of urination as well as incontinence. And also spinal cord injuries or brain damage can cause problems because we can have a neurogenic bladder. And this may be uh, spasmus, spasmic or flaccid. And then we also have interference with the central nervous system and the autonomic nervous system, um, voluntary controls of the bladder. Um, so retention is the inability to empty the bladder. You keep it retained, right? And this may be accompanied by overflow incontinence. Um, spinal cord injuries at the sacral level um, can block uh, micturation reflex. And also this may follow anesthesia, either general anesthetic or spinal uh, depth. All right. Um, what about diagnostic tests? So these are started to be discussed on page 494. So urinalysis is probably the most simple, straightforward one. And this is basically literally the appearance of urine. And so normally it is straw colored with a mild odor. And normal urine has a specific gravity of 1.010 to 1.050. Um, if it's cloudy, this may indicate the presence of a large amount of protein, blood, bacteria, and pus. Um, if it's dark color, this may indicate hematuria, uh, excessive bilirubin, or highly concentrated urine, meaning you're dehydrated. Um, or if there's an unpleasant or an unusual odor, this may be an infection that can result from certain dietary components or from medication. Um, if we have a urinary infection, um, this is a urinalysis, a smear that shows the infection with heavy purulence in the presence of gram-negative um, and gram-positive organisms. Um, and this is on page 495, figure 18.6. And so the heavy purulence in the presence of the gram-negative and gram-positive can be um, indicative of urinary infection. Also, other abnormal constituents of urine, um, hematuria, right? So blood. If there's small amounts of it uh, in your urine, then this could, lead, this could be caused by infection, inflammation, or tumors in the urinary tract. If there are large amounts, then this can be from increased glomerular permeability or hemorrhage. And um, if there are increased protein levels, this would be from proteinuria or albinuria. And this is where we have the leakage of the albumin. Right, the alburina, alburina, or mixed plasma into the proteins into the filtrate. Or if it's bacterial, which would be bacteria, this would be indicative of an infection in the urinary tract. Um, looking specifically at a urinary tract, um, this can indicate if there's a type of kidney This can indicate that there is an inflammation of the kidney tubules. Um, when you're looking at specific gravity, this can indicate the ability of the tubules to concentrate the urine. Um, if it has a low specific gravity, this means that your urine is too dilute. Um, and this is not with overhydration. This would just be with normal hydration. 
where if you have a high specific gravity, this means that you have a very concentrated urine, even though you're norm drinking normal amounts of water, and this can be related to kidney failure. Also, if you have glucose and ketones, this is found when diabetes mellitus is not well contained. And so back in the day when um, physicians were looking for uh, if you had um, diabetes, et cetera, they would smell and sometimes even taste the yeah, urine because if there's sugar in it, glucose, right, then that means that things are not going as well as they're supposed to be. And then that could be a, a diagnostic test for uh, um, for diabetes. So thankfully, we have lots of tests now that we don't have to taste urine. All right, looking at your analysis here, you can see the presence of red blood cast cells. So the little donut looking things in the urine. And this again is from um, page 495 in your book, figure 18.6. Um, with blood tests, which is started to be discussed on page 495, um, this is where we have we can have elevated serum urea and serum creatine levels, and this can indicate a failure to excrete nitrogenous wastes. Waste. My brain, I tell you, you guys, I, I am a smart person. Sometimes my brain just kind of messes up with how it's supposed to be saying things. Um, this can be caused by a decreased uh, GFR, which remember was the glomerular filtration rate. We also have metabolic acidosis, and again, this is only going to be in the absence of other problems, and this can indicate a decreased glomerular filtration rate. We can also have the failure of tubules to control acid-base imbalances, right? And then also anemia, again, in the absence of other problems, can indicate um, decreased erythropoietin secretions and or bone marrow depressions. Um, looking on at electrolytes, this depends on related fluid balances, right? Um, if they're off because other things are off, then you know that's a problem. If it's off because you're dehydrated, then you know, ah. um, drink more water. Um, antibody levels, you can have anti-streptolysin O or anti-streptokinase titers, and these are used for the diagnosis diagnoses of post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis. Um, uh, you can have elevated renin levels, and this can indicate the kidney is a cause of hypertension. You can also do culture and uh, sensitivity issues on urine specimens, and these are for identification of causative organisms of the infection, and they can help select appropriate drug treatments to make sure that we get you on the straight and narrow and the good path again. You can also have radiologic tests, and this is where we have radionuclide imaging, angiography, ultrasounds, CTs, MRI, and intravenous pyelography. Um, these are used to visualize structures and possible abnormalities, flow patterns, as well as filtration rates. Um, looking at clearance tests, um, for example, we're gonna, we can study the creatine or insulin clearance, and these are used to um, assess your levels of glomerular filtration rate. So, like, just basically how overall your kidneys are functioning, right? You can use a cyto a cytoscopy, and this is um, visualizing the lower urinary tract, and this may be used to perform a biopsy or remove kidney stones. Um, the biopsy is going to be used to acquire tissue specimens as well. For diuretic drugs, um, these are used to remove excess sodium ions and water from the body. Um, it can be excreted from uh, an excretion of water through the kidneys. It can reduce the fluid volume in tissues and blood. It can be prescribed for many disorders, including renal disease, hypertension, edema, congestive heart failure, liver disease, and pulmonary edema. Um, you also have several different mechanisms that can be used to increase your volume based on a specific drug. And some drugs are potassium wasting and some are potassium sparing. And so, for instance, like me on my with my heart and stuff like that, if I, for instance, take Lasix for a long, like an extended period of time, then um, basically what I have to do is take a little bit of potassium and um, we can, uh, I can make sure to normalize it. So here are some examples of some diuretic drugs, and this is on page 496, and um, this is table 18.2. So this would be a great little um, summary table for you guys. All right, I'm going to pause here for a second. I'm back. Did you miss me? Haha, <laughs> you didn't even know I was gone. Sorry, I had to go do some stuff and then I had to come back and finish. Okay, so um, how do we treat this? One of the big things is dialysis. 
And so dialysis is really important because it provides the filtration and reabsorption that we need when our kidneys aren't really working as well as they should be. There are two different forms of dialysis. One is hemodialysis and the other one is peritoneal dialysis. And basically, this is gonna sustain life during kidney failure. And it's used to treat patients with acute kidney failure until the primary problem is able to be reversed. And for patients that are in end stage renal failure, we use this until um, a successful kidney transplant can occur. And that's based on availability and match, and hopefully the fact that it would be successful. So a little bit on the principles of dialysis. So this is um, showing, let's see, it's figure 18.7 in your book on page 497. And so the uh, A here, which is not showing, let's see, C, D, um, C is the principles of dialysis. Okay, so at the beginning of the dialysis, there is no movement of cells and protein, and the diffusion is going from high-low concentration, and the osmotic pressure, um, and hydrostatic pressure are here. So the water is going to be going across the membrane and so are the sodium and potassium and our blood's gonna be entering. And then over time, what we're gonna be doing is you see we're going to be balancing out the concentration of the sodium and the potassium and the hydrogens um, through the uh, diastolate and so that the blood concentration isn't quite as um, as concentrated, right? And so basically we're going to be um, putting the bicarb from the bag that we're diffusing with into the body and taking out the excess sodium and potassium and hydrogens. So what is hemodialysis? In the hospital or in a dialysis center or at home with special equipment and training, you too can do hemodialysis. Hopefully you don't ever have to, right? The patient's blood is gonna move from an implanted shunt or a catheter that is implanted with an artery, within an artery, and it goes to the machine. So this is going to be doing the same thing where it's gonna be exchanging wastes, fluids, and electrolytes. And there is a semi-permeable membrane um, that is present between the blood and the dialysis fluid, which is called the diastolate. And then the blood cells and the proteins are going to remain in the blood. And after the exchange is completed, the blood is going to be returned into the patient's vein. Usually this is required three times a week and each session lasts about three to four hours. So it's very time consuming, but it gets you to stay alive. So that's awesome. There are some potential complications that um, can occur. And one would be that the shunt shunt can become infected, blood clots may form, um, blood vessels that are involved in the shunt may be sclerosed or damaged. Um, and if a patient has increased risk of infection with hepatitis B, hepatitis C, or HIV, if the standard precautions are not followed. So obviously here we're very, very blessed to be in the United States of America um, because usually our standard of care is pretty high. So hopefully we won't be running into any of those increased risk infections, but anything is possible. So this is um, the diagram of hemodialysis. And this is, again, figure 18.7 on page 497. And so um, basically what happens is the toxin-laden blood from the patient's arterial cir circulation is um, goes through a tubing pump and then a, a heparin pump to reduce clumping and clotting, sorry. And this is gonna go through the dialy dialyzer um, the blood is. And with this, the blood, the toxins are going to be diffusing through that membrane. And then it's going to go through a bubble detector because we don't want to put bubbles in your vein, in veins, your venous system. And then it would go and the clean blood would be going back into the patient's the circulation. So on the actual dialysis front, we have um, from a water source, we have a proportioning pump and the dialysis fluid concentrate is going to be um, put into this pump and the quality control and t temperature and conductivity are all occurring. And then those toxins are going to be diffusing through this membrane into the dialysis fluid. And then um, we have a blood leak detector to make sure that we're not getting any blood and we're just getting the toxins that we want and then they're gonna be going to the drain. So we can monitor what's going in and out. What about peritoneal um, dialysis? This is usually done on an outpatient basis and it may be done at night when you sleep or while the patient is ambulatory, so moving around. 
Um, peritoneal membrane is going to serve as the semi-permeable membrane, and then there's a catheter that has an entry and an exit point, and that is going to be implanted into the peritoneal cavity. And then the dialyzing fluid is going to be instilled into the cavity, and then the diastolate is going to be drained from the cavity via gravity into a container. This takes more time than hemodialysis, um, and it does require loose clothing in order to accommodate that bag of fluid. Um, one of the major uh, complications is that infections can result in um, the peritoneal cavity um, from just where the location, right? And with both types of dialysis, prophylactic antibiotics with either form of dialysis is going to occur, and any additional problems that occurs in patients such as infection may alter the dialysis requirements. And caution is required with many drugs because toxic level buildup can occur. So this is a picture, again, you can see it in figure 18.7 on page 497, and this is of the peritoneal um, dialysis, uh, dialysis. So the diastolate is going to go in, it's going to diffuse through the peritoneal cavity in your belly, and then the effluent is going to come out and collect in this sac. So you can see usually it would be done when you're sleeping or something. So moving on to disorders of the urinary system, we can have urinary tract infections, um, and these can be caused by cystitis or urethritis, um, and also polynephritis, right? And you can also have inflammatory disorders such as glomerular nephritis as well as nephrotic syndrome. So with UTIs, this is one that is incredibly common, um, and urine, unfortunately or fortunately, is an excellent growth medium. And so we can have lower urinary uh, tract infections or upper uh, urinary tract infections. And basically, the lower urinary tract infections are going to be caused um, and be located in cystitis or the urethritis. Right, and where the upper one is going to be in the polynephrons, right? So it's going to be polynephritis in the upper uh, respiratory or the <laughs> respiratory urinary tract infections. And the common causative agent is going to be E. coli. And so this is why, um, especially in females, they always say wipe front to back, right? Because if you go back to front, then you can pick up E. coli from your poop hole, right? And it can, um, you know, just have, be introduced to. Um, the vaginal area, and then it can have a uh, problem and take uh, root and uh, cause the UTI. Okay, and this is also after having fun times, you should go and clean up immediately and try to urinate so that anything that may have gotten pushed up in there can be expelled. Wow. Um, other species of organisms uh, that can be associated with UTIs are Clebacilla, Proteus, Enterobacter, Citrobacter, Serrata, Pneumonas, uh, Enterococcus, Coagulase negative, Staphylococcus, Chlamydia, and Mycoplasms. Um, these are more common in women because we have a shorter urethra, um, where a men's has to go from all the way down through the tip of the penis. The women's just has to go from the bladder down to um, the output in the vagina. And also proximity to the anus. We have, you know, three holes, urinary, um, the, the vagina, and then we have an anal hole, right? And so because a lot of people tend to wipe back to front, this is, again, another uh, complication is because of the proximity or else they're not the best at cleaning. Um, also, older men, because of prostatic hypertrophy, hypertrophy um, and urine retention can have more UTIs. And uh, congenital abnormalities in children can cause them, where other common predisposing factors can be incontinence, retention of that urine, and direct com mm, contamination with fecal material. So here is the figure of causes of the infection of the urinary tract, and this would be figure 18.8 .8 in your book on page 499. And so um, this one up here is blood-borne organisms that can lead to polynephritis, and you can have abscesses and necrosis that can occur, and then you can have a purulent exudate that comes out. Um, immobility, so you are immobile, you can't move around, right? And so then that means that the urine is static, it's stasis, it's not moving. So when you're up and moving around, it's constantly kind of getting jostled around. But if you are, for instance, paralyzed or immobile in other ways, then, you know, this can occur. Um, then you can have um, cystitis that can occur from, you know, E. coli in the intestine, urethra, you can have inflammation or trauma of the mucosa, 
And then since um, the location is here in the bladder, it can travel up the ureter, right? Um, over here, you can have visceral cuteral reflexes. And this would be like your urine reflex where um, you have a defective valve, for instance, in this upper right-hand corner. And the bladder is empty, but since you had a defective valve, then the residual urine is going to come in and fill it up after you just void it. Um, you can also have obstructions down here, and this would be where you have residual urine because, for instance, you have prostatic um, hypertrophy. So enlarged prostates in males can cause this. And so a lot of times when you have an enlarged prostate, you're not going to feel that you have a full emptying because the prostate is kind of like a squeezing donut around um, that urethra, and so it's not going to allow it to fully empty. Um so with cystitis and urethritis, um, the bladder wall would be inflammation of the bladder wall is cystitis. Inflammation of the urethra would be urethritis. So itis is inflammation of, right? And so um, look for your root words. Sorry, my nose itches. Um, and this can also cause a hyperactive bladder and reduce capacity, right? Um, pain is very common in the pelvic area. You can have dysuria. You can have urgency, frequency, and nocturia. You can also have systemic signs that can be present, such as fever, malaise, nausea, and leukocytosis. The urine is often cloudy with an unusual odor, and then your analysis can indicate that you have bacteria, polyuria, and microscopic hematuria. Okay. Um, what about polynephritis? Well, this is when one or both of the kidneys is involved, and this is in the location from the ureta into the kidney ureter into the kidney and the purulent exudate is going to fill the pelvis and the calluses and this is recurrent or a chronic inflammation and an infection and this can lead to scar tissue formation and with that scar tissue formation you can lead to a loss of tubule function the obstruction and collection of the filtrate can lead to hydronephrosis right and so hydro is water, nephrosis is within the nephron, right? And then this can lead to eventual chronic renal failure if it is left untreated. Signs of cystitis plus pain associated with, um, with renal disease can occur. And this would be dull, aching pain in that lower back or that flank area. Because remember, your kidneys are kind of located anatomically on that back wall. Systemic signs include high temperature. Um, also, when you look at your urine, it's going to the urinalysis is going to be similar to the cystitis and also those urinary casts are going to be present and this is the reflection that there is involvement of the renal renal tubules so how do we treat these well um bactrim septra cotrim um keflex duraflex amoxicillin right uh, famoxifen. So a lot of different um, treatments are available depending on what type of um, infection it is and if you're pregnant or not, right? Um, I have blisters on my hands from writing, sorry. Um, so talk, moving on to inflammatory disorders, to talk about glomerular nephritis. Um, there are many different forms of glomerular nephritis, and this is um, beginning to be talked about on page 500. Um, basically, there's a presence of anti-streptococcal antibodies, and this is caused by a formation of an antigen antibody complex, and this together is going to activate a complement system. And this then leads to an inflammatory response present in the glomeruli. And then this increases that capillary permeability. So like how easily things can transport across the membrane. And that can lead to leakage of some proteins and a large number of erythrocytes that weren't supposed to get through. And this is a severe inflammatory response. And um, it can cause congestion as well as cellular proliferation. And that can lead to a decrease in glomerular filtration rate, um, leading to, therefore, a retention of fluid and waste in the body. Um, with glomerular nephritis, the urine is going to become dark and cloudy. Um, you can have facial and periorbital, so around the eyes, peri is around, and orbital is the uh, eye sockets, edema, so that's swelling. Um, and this can be initially, and then general edema will follow. This can also lead to elevated blood pressure. And this is caused by increased renin secretion and decreased glomerular filtration rate. You can also have flank and back pain because of anatomical location. This can lead to edema and also stretching of that renal capsule. 
and um, there are also general signs of inflammation, and all of these can combine to lead to decreased urine output. Blood tests that we can use to um, detect this, they're going to show elevated serum urea and creatinine, um, creatinine levels. Um, you can also have elevation of anti-DNA B, streptococcal antibodies, anti-streptolysin, as well as anti-streptokinase. And these complements levels are decreased, and these are going to be used in renal inflammation. You can also have metabolic acidosis that occurs, and when we do a urinalysis, it's going to show proteinuria, hemonuria, erythrocyte casts, but there will be no evidence of infection. Treatment is discussed on page 501, and this would be sodium restriction is possible, so don't eat salt, extra salt on your french fries, right? No. Stay away from salty foods, right, so that we can not retain water. <clears throat> um, also, uh, in super severe cases, you're going to want to decrease your protein and fluid intake, right, so that you're not maintaining and retaining extra water. And then also, you can use drug treatments um, such as glucocorticoids to reduce inflammation and also antihypertensives. So those would be your blood pressure medications. Um, so this is a diagram about post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis, and this is figure 18.9 in your book on page 501, and um, this is the development and course of post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis. So up here, you're going to have your streptococcal infection, and then that's going to lead to your antibody in, uh, formation. And then over here on the side, you're going to have several weeks, weeks later, you're going to have elevated ASO and ASK titers that are going to be um, drawn or shown. Uh, you have antigen antibody complex that's going to be forming, and then this is going to be uh, causing the deposits to be made in the glomerulus. And then all this together is going to lead to an acute inflammation and damage, which can um, cause either increased permeability of the capillary, which lets things in that it's not supposed to, glomerular swelling, or cell proliferation, so the cell growth. So if we have the increased in permeability, then, you know, and it's letting things in that it's not supposed to be, this can lead to hematuria and albinuria, so um, problems with blood and albumin. And then the glomerular swelling and cellular perforation can cause congestion, which would lead to decreased glomerular filtration rate, the oliguria, as well as elevated serum, serum urea. Um, this can also cause a stimulation of the renal secretion, and this is elevated blood pressure and edema that can occur. Then you group all of these together, and you can, um, the majority are going to, thankfully, yay, over here, have a full recovery, where a few over here are going to have ARF, <laughs> right, acute renal failure. It's not funny. It's just funny to say ARF. Um, and then some over here can have chronic glomerular nephritis which is uh, fibrosis, and that can lead to renal failure. And unfortunately, with the acute renal failure, this um, mainly leads to death. So looking at the post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis a little bit more, symptomatic representation of changes that occur in the nephron with the acute um, post-streptococcal glomerulitis. And so this you can see on page 502 in your book, and it is figure 18.10. So up here you have a normal glomerulus, and this purple here is going to be an endothelial cells cell, where this red open spot is going to be a capillary that's open, allowing blood flow to go through. So this is A-OK -okay good. Down here with um, in the middle with mild glomerulonephritis, you have a swollen endothelial cell um, and membrane, so that's like the purple area, and then that's going to cause some narrowing of the caps, capillary lumen, and the, therefore the um, glomerular filtration rate is going to decrease. And then in the yellow things over here, this is going to be where the immune complex are going to have deposits, and this is from inflammation. And then this leads to red blood cells and protein leaks into the filtrate, which is going to cause hematuria and proteinuria. proteinuria. Okay, so you can see that they're going to be leaking out. So that's mild glomerular nephritis. We're down here in severe glomerular nephritis. We're going to have very swollen cells, which are the purple cells. You're going to have in the yellow the immune complex deposits that are going to cause severe inflammation. Then um, the purple again is going to be uh, cellular proliferation, so growth. 
and then since everything is, is gotten so big it's going to be squishing in on that blood flow and so this is going to cause very little blood flow which is termed oliguria okay so you can see normal mild and severe glomerular nephritis so moving on to urinary tract obstructions, um, specifically talking about urolithesis, which is the, the um, you know, your kidney stones, uh, hypernephritis, as well as tumors. So this is going to be discussed on page 503 in your book. So this is figure 18.11 in your book, again on page 503. And this is going to show the major sites of the urinary tract obstruction. And so um, you can have up here, uh, you have transitional cell carcinoma of the renal pelvis that's going to occur. You can have uh, polycystic kidney. So you can see all these little cysts where this one is more smooth. This one has a lot of cysts. Um, you can have hydronephrosis. You can have dysplasia, which is the tissue displacement, right? And so this is dysplasia, agenesis of the ureter. You can have a blood clot. You can have a ureteral stone. You can have carcinoma of the cervix. You can have endometriosis, and you can have pregnancies that can all squish up against the ureters. And these are all called extrinsic compression because it's coming from external. It's not inside the kidney itself, but it's getting pushed up against from other things such as a baby growing. Um, over here, you can have the uteropelvic valve that can become obstructed. You can have the uteropelvic uh, stricture, which again, the tube itself is getting constricted. You can have a fibrous band that forms and it just kind of kinks it off. You can have stenosis, which is a narrowing of any tube. You can have um, transitional cell carcinoma of the bladder that can occur over here. You can have a ureteral orifice over here. Uh, you can have the posterior ves uh, um valve, which is a reflex. Um, in the male, you can have uh, prostate hypertrophy. Obviously, pregnancy would be for a female. Um, you can have your, your genital diaphragm that can have some problems. And you can have a urethral sphinc sphincter, which is like the valve, right, going in and out, that can have a problem. Or you can have urethral stenosis where the urethra actually gets stenosed or gets so incredibly narrow that nothing can go through. So looking out the urolithesis um, or calculi, kidney stones is commonly what it's called. This is on page 503. And these can develop anywhere in their urinary tract. And the stones may be very small or very large. And they tend to form with excessive amounts of solutes in the filtrate. Um, they mostly can become... Uh, present from an insufficient amount of fluid intake. And this is obviously going to be, again, a major uh, factor in calculi formation, as well as repeated urinary um, tract infections. So I actually have a friend that would get these all the time, and he would have to, he could only drink filtered water. Um, you know, so he had like a double Brita, right? And because he always got kidney stones, and so he was just genetically pre predisposed to them, but he had to be very careful about drinking a lot of water and making sure that it was filtered water. Manifestations only occur with obstruction of urine flow, and this may lead to infection. You can also have hydronephrosis with a dilation of the calluses, and if this is located in the kidney of the ureta, re, ureter and atrophy of the renal tissue. Um, calculi are going to be composed of calcium salts, and this is because there is a high urine amount of calcium in there, and these form readily with highly alkaline urine. Um, and so uric acid stones can also form. And this is from hyperuricemia, and this can be resulting from gout, high purine level diets, or cancer chemotherapy. And these are especially true with acidic urine. You can have struvate and cystate stones also, and you can also have stone formation, and this depends on predisposing factors. Okay, um, so for signs and symptoms, um, stones in the kidney or bladder are often asymptomatic, um, and there are frequent infections of these, and this is what may lead to um, an investigation, right? Because you have a lot of frequent infections. And flank pain, again, can be possible because of a distension of the renal capsule. Renic, renal colic can be caused by an obstruction of the ureter, and this is where you would have intense spasm of pain in the flank area. 
um, and this can radiate into the groin area, and this lasts until the stone passes or it is removed. There's also the possibility of nausea and vomiting that comes along with these, um, along with cool, moist skin and a rapid pulse. Radiologic examination is going to confirm the location of the calculi. So kidney stones, guys, they're supposed to be incredibly painful. So I personally have never had any, but my dad actually had a few too. And, um, you know, it, they equate it in males to the uh, same amount of pain as women in um, giving birth, right? So they can be excruciatingly painful. Um, so how are we going to treat it? Well, small stones will be passed eventually. Um, on its own, but if they're bigger and they don't think that they're going to be able to pass, then they're going to be using ESWL, which is extracorporeal shockwave latroscopy. And um, this is basically like sending sound waves in there to break it up. Um, and they can also use lasers to break them up. Sometimes they can also use drugs to try to dissolve the stones partially to make them smaller so that you can naturally pass them. And if all else fails, you can have surgery um, to remove them if they're very large. Um, how to prevent these? Well, treat the underlying condition. Um, make sure that you adjust the urine pH through dietary uh, modifications and make sure that you have a consistent increased amount of fluid intake. So drink your water, guys. It's really good. Uh, what about hydronephrosis? Well, this is a secondary problem that would, can be caused by the complication of calculi, um, tumors, scar tissues in kidney or the ureter. You can also have untreated prostatic enlargement, um, developmental abnormalities, restricting urine flow. Frequently, uh, you have a, this is going to be asymptomatic in early stages, but it can be diagnosed with ultrasounds, uh, radionucleotide imaging, CTs, or renal scans. And if the cause is not removed, this can lead to stomach renal failure. Oh, I have two little finches on my bird feeder. Um, okay, so here are some pictures. So you know how much I love pictures. Um, so this is going to be on page 504 of your book. This is figure 18.10. And so over here on the left, it has renal calculi and the hydronephrosis. So you can see the little green deposits are those calculi. And then we also have a dilated area that's going to be filled with urine, so we can't lead to full draining. And then we also have renal tissue atrophy, so the tissue is getting um, weak and going away. Down here in P, uh, B, this is hydronephrosis with the dilation of the renal pelvis and the calluses, as well as atrophy in the renal tissue. So moving on to renal failure, not so much fun. So hypertension and the kidney. So this is a um, overall figure on what's going to be going on with hypertension in the kidney. So this is the relationship between hypertension and the kidney. This is figure 18.14 in your book on page 506. So we will start over here at 1. Hypertension can lead to a decreased bone, uh, or sorry, decreased blood to nephron, and that can lead over here to a lot of different things that we'll come back in um, number 8. So, but if we have Occurring to the nephrons, and this can stimulate the re renal it's an aldosterone system. And that's going to cause systemic vasoconstriction, which can lead back up to decrease the blood flow to the nephrons. So this can be like a vicious kind of negative cycle, right? Um, this renal and al angiotensin aldosterone system activation can also lead to sodium and water retention, and therefore that can lead to an increased amount of blood volume. Um, leading to a disruption of the concentration of sodium and water. And then also, because of this, we have less space and um, more fluid for the circulating blood. And then this can lead to increased blood pressure, which increased blood pressure can, guess what, lead to hypertension. And again, another negative circle. This hypertension increased blood pressure can also lead to renal vascular damage and nephrosclerosis where this is going to be showing the arterioles and the arteries getting sclerosed, right? So really a, a lot smaller in diameter. And then this can lead, again, to decreased blood that's going to occur to the nephrons. Over here, that decreased blood uh, to the nephron can also cause um, chronic renal failure. 
because um, the decreased blood to the nephrons can lead to an interference with the blood flow, which can lead to ischemia, and this can lead to necrosis of the renal tissue. And when that tissue is going to die, then it's not going to be plia pliable and malleable, and that can lead to fibrosis. And then that, therefore, can lead to atrophy of the kidney, therefore leading to chronic renal failure. So it's all interconnected, and one thing has a lot of effects on other things, and so you just really have to, um, you know, try to keep everything at that homeostatic level so things don't go crazy and out of control. So acute renal failure is discussed on page 507 in your book. Um, the causes can be acute bilateral kidney diseases, severe prolonged circulatory shock or heart failure, um, nephrotoxins such as drugs, chemicals, or toxins, mechanical obstructions occasionally can cause it, and this can be from like calculi or blood clots or tumors, and what happens is it blocks urine flow beyond the kidneys, so then that can cause a lot of problems. Um, ARF it usually has a sudden onset. Uh, the blood tests can um, show elevated serum levels of urea nitrogen and creatine levels, and also metabolic acidosis can occur as well as hyperkalemia. How to treat it? Well, first we have to identify and remove the risk um, and treat the primarily the primary problem, and this is is needed in order to minimize the risk of necrosis and permanent kidney damage. Also, we can do dialysis, and this would be to normalize the body fluids as well as maintain homeostasis. Um, so here is a nice diagram of the causes of renal failure from nephrotoxins, and this is figure 18.16 on page 508. So you can see here that the filtrate is going to become very concentrated, and then this concentrated filtrate um, the concentrated nephrotoxin is going to lead the tubule wall to become swollen and very necrotic. So you can see that this would be a new normal hole or lumen, but then when you have an obstructed lumen, it gets very, very small. And then because of that, the filtrate is going to have a very high backup pressure because it's like trying to push through, but it can't. And so because of that, it's going to cause a decreased overall um, glomerular filtration rate. And then all of that leading together can lead to oliguria. Um, so what about um, ischemia? Again, same figure, figure 18.16 on page 508. So with the glomerulus, if you have, for instance, a severe shock, this can lead to vasoconstriction, and that can lead to decreased blood flow. Um, this can lead to problems with your tubules, where we have ischemia, swelling, necrosis, and obstruction. You can also have the filtrate, which is, again, going to have that high back pressure. And again, all these together can lead to the oliguria. And then the last one, still in the same figure, 18.16 on page 508, is oliguria, polynephritis, uh, nephrosis, nephritis, sorry, polynephritis. And this is where that purulent exudate and the abscesses are going to block flow of the blood as well as the urine. What about chronic renal failure? And this is on page 509. Well, this is gradual and irreversible destruction of the kidneys over a long period of time, and it's asymptomatic in many of the early stages, and this can result from a chronic kidney disease, congenital polycystic kidney disease, systemic disorders, as well as low-level exposures to nephrotoxins over a very long sustained period of time. Um, so the stages are the, that you have decreased renal reserves. This is going to therefore decrease um, the glomerular filtration rate. Um, that's, there's going to be higher than normal serum creatine levels, and then also no apparent clinical symptoms. You also have renal insufficiency, and this can lead to decreased GFR to about 20% of the normal rate. And this is significant. This causes significant retention of nitrogen waste. And also there's an excretion of large volumes of dilute urine, and this causes decreased erythropoiesis and er therefore elevated blood pressure. What about end-stage renal failure? Um, so this is no bueno, right? And this is uh, where you have a negligible um, glomerular filtration rate. The fluid, electrolytes, and wastes are going to be retained in the body. Um, it can cause azotomia, anemia, and acidosis, which are known as the three A's, and all body systems are going to be affected at this point. 
um, you are going to have the marked levels of oliguria or anuria, and regular dialysis or kidney transplant transplantation is the only way to help um, maintain a patient's normal life or some sense of normalcy. Um, so what about the development of the chronic renal failure? Um, this. this is going to be figure 18.17 in your book on page 510. And so um, on the x-axis, we have time. So here we have function is 100%. Here you have decreasing renal reserve, um, which would be asymptomatic. Here you have renal insufficiency. And then here you have end-stage renal failure. And the this is number of nephrons going up to 2 million. So um, would be uh, normal kidneys would have a lot, right? When we have non-functional areas, then you're going to be more in this area, right? Where you have fibrotic areas, you're going to be more in this part of the um, graph with the table. When you have extensive damage, you're going to be down into this area where you have more of the renal insufficiencies and these problems, where when you have your fibrotic kidneys where they're causing it to shrink, you're going to be down here in the end stage um, renal failure. Early signs of chronic renal failure would be increased urinary output. Um, there are general signs uh, such as anorexia, you don't want to eat, you're nauseous all the time, low iron levels, you're tired, unintended weight loss, exercise intolerance, you just kind of feel blah and you just kind of can't do anything. Um, also bone marrow depression and impaired cell function can occur. And this is caused by increased in waste and altered blood chemistry, and this can lead to um, elevated blood pressure. Um, with complete failure, you can have oliguria, dot, uh, dry, putritic, hyperpigmented skin with very easy bruising, uh, peripheral neuropathy, um, so pain right in your extremities, uh, impotence in men, menstrual irregularities in women, encephalopathy, congestive heart failure, dysarrhythmias, failure to activate vitamin D, as well as possible uremic frost on the skin, and systemic infections. Um, how are we going to diagnose these? Well, metabolic acidosis becomes decompensated, and um, you're going to have azotonia, and um, then anemia is going to become very severe, and the serum electrolyte levels may vary depending on the amount of water that's going to be retained in the body. And usually hyponatremia and hyperkalemia occur, as well as hypocalcemia and hypophospholatemia. How do we treat these? Well, all, all body systems are affected, and it is difficult to maintain homeostasis of fluids, electrolytes, and acid-base balances. Um, we use drugs to stimulate the erythropoiesis. Um, also, we use drugs to treat cardiovascular problems. We have an intake of fluid, electrolytes, and proteins, and this must be restricted so that we don't overtax our already taxed system. And then also dialysis and transplantation. So the final slide here is a comparison of acute renal uh, failure to chronic renal failure. And this is table 18.3 in your book on page 509. So you can see, again, you have causes. Um, acute renal failure can be from severe shock, burns, nephrotoxins, acute bilateral kidney infections, etc. Um, the onset is sudden, where in chronic it's slow. Early signs would be your oliguria increased serum urea, um, where in the chronic reno, uh, renal failure, it's going to be polyuria with the urine, etc. Okay, good job, you guys. We will see you in class. Have a good one. Bye-bye.